For, uh, thanks everyone for coming out to the uh, CHEP seminar this week. Appreciate it. We're very fortunate to have Stephanie Fisher uh, joining us from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, she is a labor economist who does lots of work on public policy topics, has published really well in top field journals in labor economics and uh, economics of education. And today she's going to be presenting her politically sensitive paper yeah. <laughs> on the, uh, the impacts of yeah. reduced access to abortion and family planning services evidence from Texas. Thank you so yeah. much for coming. Well, thank you, Joe, for inviting me. And uh, I had really nice conversations with many of you today. So thank you for taking the time to meet with me. Um, this is joint work with uh, Heather Royer, who's a, a health economist at UC Santa Barbara. She's also an affiliate, a research fellow at ISEA and the NBR. And then uh, it's also joint with a colleague of mine uh, at Cal Poly, uh, Corey White. And the goal of this paper is to better understand how access to two different types of clinics, abortion clinics and non-abortion family planning clinics, affect uh, fertility behavior. Uh, well, as Joe mentioned, um, I'll, I'll elaborate on that. This is a politically sensitive paper as you, topic, as you probably already uh, can tell. More politically, like more sensitive than we thought when we started a, a year and a half ago collecting the data. Um, it's also a time sensitive topic because many of the policies we study here are being discussed at other, in other states um, and at the national level. So we think um, we can say something to inform those discussions. So just to give you a little background, there's been a major contraction in the supply of clinics over the last six, seven years. Uh, according to Guttmacher, there's been about 230 abortions, uh, or sorry, a, a abortion clinic restrictions implemented at the state level. Um, nine states currently prohibit some family plan, some types of family planning clinics from receiving uh, public funding, state dollars or federal dollars. And then there's some others uh, at this point um, on their way to implementing this same type of policy. And there's been talk of, um, uh, at least within the last year, of overturning the federal law Roe v. Wade, which um, essentially legalized ab abortion in 1973 at the, at the federal level. Uh, and I think this quote by, at the time he was president of Alexis, I guess he's president now, but when he, when he was quoted saying this um, uh, to an, uh, an uh, interviewer who asked him his thoughts or his, the implications of um, what would happen in his, in his thoughts of what would happen if, uh, if uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned and he said, well, perhaps the women will have to go to another state. And I think this sort of highlights or motivates that reducing access does increase the cost. So if we're just thinking about a very really simple economic model there. On the other side, there's a large demand for both um, uh, for these types of clinics, both abortion and uh, publicly funded uh, family planning clinics. In 2014, about 40 million women sought some type of contraceptive care because they were of childbearing age and wished not to become pregnant. Uh, about half of those uh, qualified, according to Guttmacher, qualified for um, some type of publicly funded services or supplies. Um, this is because they were either 250 or like very poor, 250 percent below the federal poverty line, or you know minor, like young uh, teens. It's not surprising that um, that so many women of childbearing age are seeking contraceptives uh, because you know there's an unintended pregnancy, both to society and to the individual, has been shown to be costly. So there's a recent paper in the AJ applied by uh, Kevin Ling and, Re and Russell Weinstein that show unintended pregnancies are quite are particularly costly to uh, teens as far as education attainment and uh, later earnings. Okay, so, um, and when we say, well, and then despite that, uh, about half of births are unintended, which includes missed times, but also um, unwanted. And, and I should say, sort of despite this large demand and this, um, this uh, contraction in the supply clinics over the last uh, several years, uh, public funding for these types of clinics and the existence of abortion clinics remains, as you can probably tell, or as you know, very controversial among policymakers, but also the general public. Um, so this is a funny slide, maybe, to some of you. So why has there been a redu reduction in access? I added this slide about six months ago when I gave a very shortened version of this talk uh, at the IZA Institute for Labor Economics. Uh, it was a room full of a European econ labor economists and one nice young gentleman in the front uh, at the beginning of the talk asked me, he didn't understand you know, why there have been changes in the supply of, of these, of these uh, clinics and services. And so you know, any time there's um, uh, a change in access, 
it's politically controversial, uh, and in part because uh, it is the belief of many that it's unconstitutional, the existence of these clinics and um, using federal dollars or state dollar tax dollars to fund these types of uh, contrac or subsidized contraceptives. So I think you know you can you can think about it as uh, there's sort of I mean, if you allow me to overgeneralize you, you can sort of, sort of think about it in two camps on the one side of the aisle they see on the right they see um, this as these you know reducing access or implementing policy that restricts supply of these types of clinics as preserving life and the health of women and on the other side you can see or they view them uh, you know expanding access policies that expand access as um, uh, uh, as a, like a safety net program, okay? So, just, but, yeah. sorry, just a small point on yeah. the comparison when you mentioned presenting this in, in yeah. Europe. So, I mean, isn't it, isn't it true, not to be pedantic, but isn't it, isn't it true that in, in, in many European, Western European countries, yeah. right, that, that there's greater sort of a access to abortion services, but then there are more limitations that are put in on... Yeah, I don't, I don't know the nuances of those. So, it might have been, uh, it might have been, it, it might have been odd, the, this, the particular gen one, but I thought I'd add sort of that there is, there is, it's controversial every time there's a policy. And the, yeah, it might be the case that um, there, there certainly are studies looking at abortion access in Europe. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, it, these just sort of motivate that, you know, Rick, this is a quote, the top is a quote by uh, governor, the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, when House Bill 2 was signed into law. Um, and then this is sort of like, you know, the, the, the other side of the aisle's response, general uh, sentiment, you know, they're trying to provide critical health ser healthcare services, okay? So that's sort of um, the background there. But more importantly, there are two types of clinics that we study here, um, and in our setting, they're going to be distinct. So the first type um, are abortion clinics, and they, provide, they exclusively provide abortion services. And what's important is they're not eligible to receive federal funds. They actually haven't been since the, since the um, legal, legalization of abortion at the federal level. Some states do fund uh, abortions with state dollars. The, the, the policy setting we're using, Texas, they, they do not. So in our setting, abortion clinics um, don't receive uh, state funds. They don't receive federal funds. They're, you can think of them as standalone clinics. Um, they could be private practitioners, those types of clinics. The other type of clinic we study are family planning clinics. And in our setting, they don't provide abortion services. They're actually not eligible to. Um, that's not the case in every state, but in Texas, that's the case. You can think of plan family planning clinics as providing a, a, lo a, lot of ver a lot of different types of services. Their largest um, is to provide free and subsidized contraceptives, but they also provide cancer screenings, uh, S STI screenings, treatments, uh, sex education, pregnancy tests, etc. Um, what's important here? Oh, and I guess you know maybe you're most familiar with Planned Parenthood. Is that's the largest network of family planning clinics in the U.S. These, these clinics are funded um, both by federal dollars and state dollars, depending on the state. Um, so they, they're largely funded by Title X Family Planning Program and Medicaid, um, and then also private contributions. So like the Bill Mullen Gates um, give money to some types of Planned Parenthoods, for example. Are, th are there any restrictions in Texas on uh, abortion-related counseling services that can be offered at these clinics? At these clinics? I don't know about that, but I do know they're not eligible to, 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 to do a referral. So they can't have a, they can tell you about, they can give you information, but they can't actually uh, undergo a formal referral, which would like make, which would reduce the cost of basically, yeah. So, yeah, but we do, there could be an information channel. So, you know, when family planning clinic access is reduced, you might expect to see a change in abortions, right? It could be that um, now there's more unintended pregnancies and there's an increase in abortions, or it could be, this information channel, or there could be no effect. It turns out we don't really find an effect, um, which is also not that um, surprising since they don't provide abortion services. But um, and then, yeah, I guess I should just note: in 2003 is when um, <laughs> there was a, a piece of, of legislation at the, at the state level in Texas that prohibited abortion clinics or family planning clinics from providing um, abortion. So they're, they're two distinct types of, of clinics. So it's worthwhile thinking about um, how each of these types of clinics may affect fertility behavior. So um, it's, it's, we'll start, we'll begin with abortion clinics. So when they close, it's essentially increasing the cost of obtaining those services. Um, that treatment's pretty clear. Uh, so we'll start here. And we think there's at least four different ways individuals could be changing their behavior. So the first is 
is that, um, you know, without, with reduced access, a woman could just have a child when she otherwise would not have. If this is the case, you might expect to see births increase. She may just travel farther um, to a border state or to, uh, uh, to a city that has a, has, still has a clinic existing. Um, and at the very extreme, if every person who was affected traveled, you might see no change in births. Um, you could imagine that individuals take up precautionary measures. Um, so these, it's, that might sound strange, but these were actually pretty uh, highly publicized cuts, both at the national level and the state level, and so it, in various media outlets. So you could imagine individuals see this, and now they're more careful, or they're taking up use of over-the-counter contraceptives, or, or what have you. Um, and then. It, Fourth, it's possible that women could have illegal abortions when they um, otherwise would not have before the reduced access. Um, we're going to be able to test these three with our data. With, this project actually started here. I've mentioned that to some of you I've met with today. Um, we wanted to get emergency room data and see if there was an increase in, uh, in visits to the ER. Um, you might imagine if you're obtaining an, these services through an unlicensed provider or and it, over the border in Mexico, that there's a greater probability of something going wrong, and then you come back to Texas and you visit the ER, um, you might expect to see imaging ultrasounds increase. So that, that was the measure I was thinking when I started this project long ago. Um, and we weren't able to get the data. We spent a year in IRB, and um, uh, another group of researchers also did, and the ACLU got involved, and then we, my co-authors and I said, we're just going to look at these three and get, stay out of the drama. So. So that's where that's at, but I do actually think this is quite interesting. And um, there's also this idea of dr there's a, a drug that you can uh, get in Mexico without a prescription. It's like mycipronol or something like that. But anyway, so we'll we'll look at these. We're going to be able to say something there. When we think about family planning services, the treatment's a little it's two part um, because first you can think of reduce access to these as just reducing access to free or subsidized contraceptives. Um, we think that, it, well, so if that's the case, it, well, you know, the, when, this, when access is reduced, individuals um, may be less likely to use contraceptives, right? In which case we might see a, an increase in birth. Um, but it also might be the case that individuals substitute towards over-the-counter contraceptives. Um, and we actually do find evidence of this. And yeah. So is this going from like taking a birth control pill to buying condoms? Yeah, or Plan B. Unfortunately, we can't look at Plan B in our retail scanner data because Plan B became legal in the middle of our period, and it happens to coincide with some of our variation, that, so it's not very clean. Um, but we look, we do a falsification. I'll show you those results, okay. but yeah. But what are the, the, the OTC contraceptives that you do measure in the scanner data? Male condoms. Okay. We could look at female condoms. The problem is those also include all these pregnancy tests, ovulation tests that would work in the opposite direction, so they would, yeah, anyhow. So what we do look at a bunch of other categories as falsification tests and do seem to find that, that it looks like, and that's sort of in line with Joe and Mark's paper, I think, uh, when the cost of abortion increased, there's, these teens are substituting towards breast control. The second treatment is this reduced information. I think this is what Joe was getting at earlier. You can imagine that these, these one of the services they, these clinics provide is, is sex education or counseling. Um, you could think of that as an information story, um, and, it, and it, if that's the case, individuals might be less likely to take precautionary measures. If that's the case, you'd expect to see a uh, first increase. Now, um, abort, how this, all these affect abortion I mentioned is a bit ambiguous because of there's a change in, um, there's, you know, there might be more unintended pregnancies, but there's also um, less information, okay? So. so I guess all to say, there's, there's a myriad of predictions with these two different types of clinics and these two different treatments within these types of clinics. We view this as um, an empirical exercise, and so that's sort of where, that's where our contribution lies, yeah. So just to get back to the main question here, we're, we're after how does reduced ac access to clinics affect women's fertility behavior, and we're going to look at three different outcomes. So we look at uh, abortions, those are, that's count data. We look at births. Um, that's, count, that's count data, and then we also are going to be able to look at over-the-counter uh, contraceptive purchases. We study this question in the context of Texas. Why Texas? It turns out Texas is nice for several reasons. I think the, the, the main reason it's nice is because 
it has uh, exogenous variation in access, or what we're claiming to be exogenous, and we hope that we convince you that, that, that it is. Um, Texas also has the third highest uh, teen pregnancy rate in the US, so um, sort of, uh, ex ante, we, we think that maybe this is impacting teens. Um, there's also a few changes to the access in the surrounding ta uh, states um, of Texas during this time period, although we do control for access in the surrounding states, but it just sort of helps us um, narrow in on uh, understanding how these policies affect um, uh, births and abortions and purchasing behavior. For, yeah. for, for the teen mechanism, there yeah. are often sort of a lot of conversation around how, say, well, I mean, most directly, sort of parental involvement or parental yeah. laws for abortion could encourage greater communication between sure. teens and their parents about these sort. So, what, to what extent do you think there could be sort of substitution of sort of sources of information oh. um, between the the family planning clinics and, and the parents other stepping in? And, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I so. So I don't think, so this is not what you asked, but I don't think the parental involvement laws are confounding these because they haven't changed over this period, which is not what you're saying. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it could be that they're, they're stepping in, but there could be a, a group, a group that, that doesn't, that's not getting that. I mean, I don't know. We can't really look at that, um, but I could look into that anecdotally. So is there, and also we don't show that teens, we don't, we don't observe in the, the retail scanner data the age. We just know that they're on average, so we don't find effects for teens, and we find them in older women for the birth results. So we think that it's suggestive that teens are taking up on this. And partly, I'll explain later, but we think the marginal cost of having a child is greater for a teen than someone that has a couple children or one child or two ch children already, which is also what we find in the. Um, you disagree having a child, I'm guessing? I don't have any children, so. The cost of the second is much higher than the first. Oh, OK. Well, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to talk about this more later. <laughs> The empirical design is quite simple. So we're essentially leveraging three pieces of legislation in Texas that occurred over our, our sample period um, and those greatly reduced access. So we're basically look, comparing outcomes in counties that are relatively, that experienced a, a, a change in access to counties that experienced relatively little change or no change. Um, and then, of course, this is like a cross county in time. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely positive you're going to get to this, but. The, the laws you have that lead to these clinic closures, do they affect both types of clinics at the same time? No. So that's okay. what's like, okay. so one thing that I think a major, and I'll get to this in a minute, about I think that's a contribution of this paper. Okay. You separately identify. Yeah. So I'll show you all the variation in some maps and across time, and hopefully I'll convince you that we have this separate variation and that we are going to be able to say something about. Um, it turns, yeah. And we control for one, and we always control for the other, yeah. So just a preview of the findings, in case you have to duck out early or you fall asleep. Abortion clinic closure. So we have, we kind of like, subs, we kind of parse this into two groups of, uh, two sets of results. The first is deal with abortion clinic closures and then we'll go into the family planning clinic and I'll do that, I'll follow that um, through the, when I explain the results. But we find, you know, not surprising that when um, over half the clinics close in the state, um, there's a jury crease in the within, and I should highlight the within, Texas abortion rate. We, we do find descriptively this is partially offset by uh, traveling, by increases in uh, abortions in out-of-states to non-residents, right? So it's descriptive, and I'll show you that, but we do think that, that, that some people are traveling. Um, and, and so part of the, and I'll explain this when I get to the data, but you know, we're not gonna be able to say if there's a net change in abortion because abortion data are collected pretty poorly, and so it's hard to get all of the travel and the travel to Mexico, but we think that because of that, our birth results are much more important to think about because that's um, maybe ultimately what you might care about. Um, so uh, we also show that there's some heterogeneity, so they're driven by married and older women with children, which is what I mentioned, and we'll come back to that, uh, why we think that's the case and some evidence for why. The family planning clinic results, so we do find an increase in births for Texas residents. It seems to be driven by um, teens and low education women and, and women with children, and those might sound like really different groups, but it turns out that these types of clinics are aimed at serving teens and, and like poor women. Um, the, the married women with children is a little strange unless you know that long-acting reversible contraceptives, IUDs, are taken up at three times the rate for that group, and those are also one of the um, 
services that were greatly reduced when these clinics, uh, when the access was reduced, okay? And then we do find suggestive evidence of substitution to over-the-counter contraceptives when these family planning clinic, when family planning clinic access reduced. Uh, and when I say contraceptives, to Ryan's point, that's male condoms, and we look at other groups, but, but we think male condoms is the cleanest. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about where this fits in with the literature. I'll try to give you a brief overview of the policies we leverage here. We'll talk about the data. We compile a lot of data sets to try to answer this question, some cleaner than others. Uh, we'll talk about how, you know, exactly the, the model we're estimating, the results, and then we'll wrap it up and take questions. You, you can ask me questions throughout. So we're obviously not the first to think about this. There's a, a large literature on reproductive services that, you know, Joe's contributed to and many others. And um, we really see our contribution as falling into the two different subsets of this literature. And the first is this access to abortion. Um, and essentially all of these papers are exploiting changes in the cost of obtaining abortion. And the first um, focus on the early legalization of, of abortion, pre Roe v. Wade, and the latter focus on leveraging you know, ni the 97 policy. And all of these papers have kind of the same findings as the birth rates decrease as, ac as access expands. Um, there's uh, a kind of a more recent paper. So this is sort of, these are older, using older, relying on older data sets or more historic data sets. Um, here we have a more recent paper looking at changes to late-term abortion laws. Um, and then our co-author, Heather, has a paper with Murray Jacobson looking at, which is sort of similar to ours in that uh, they're looking at change, like an increase in, or sorry, an increase in the cost of obtaining abortion through this violence um, channel. And they, they seem to find that a lot of this effect is offset by travel as well. The other literature we contribute to deals with the, is, is a, uh, access to contraceptives and family planning. Um, the first, the early papers on this, lever and, and even more modern or recent papers, leverage the expansion or the rollout of oral contraceptives in the 50s. That's when basically the pill became legal and it rolled out. Um, the, second are, um, the second set of papers look at parental involvement laws on fertility behavior, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's this group of papers that are very recent, um, and I would call them concurrent, some, I mean, some of these are published, but these two are concurrent papers um, that were all kind of like, <laughs> unfortunately, it's a little bit race to the, or race to the finish. I mean, I would like to think of it more as like, this is an important policy question and we should all try to get it right, and however, you know, I think that's the collegial way forward here, but th this, um, <laughs> this, uh, uh, these two, uh, the second, or sorry, there's four papers here. The last two um, focus on just the family planning cuts, and they, they look at um, that in a more narrow scope than, than we're doing. This Lou and Slusky paper that's a current working paper is um, looking at just uh, family planning, and they're looking at um, the reduction in access to one network. It's a large network. I think it's Planned Parenthood, although um, based on their, some of their other work, but they say it's a, the largest network, but they don't reveal the name. But they're, they're looking at one network. Um, and then these guys, um, I think up until really recently, were just looking at abortions and some congestion in abortion clinic data. Or data. So there was, a, I recall, a University of Michigan working paper, oh. it appeared sort of anywhere, that oh. was looking at the right. effect of, a, of changes in the price of contraception on college campuses mm. due to a quirky change in a, a, a deficit reduction act by the federal government where there was a, a quirky unintended They need to get rid of some money? Yeah, that, 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 no, it got, it got rid of a, an implicit subsidy for contraceptive services on college campuses and they were looking at uh, effects of changes in the price of, you know, big, oh. big changes in the price of contraception on college campuses on contraceptive use and sexual behavior, and I was just curious whether they've extended any of that to look at births or abortions. I don't know, but I, I don't know of it, and we've like kind of scoured, and because it is sort of sensitive and time, and, and there's these other papers, we've kind of scoured the, but we should check, the, okay. okay. So you think it's a working paper? It was, at, it was working okay. paper in the Okay. Later. I, was, I was just yeah. curious whether, it, given that you had scoured literature, so yeah. I haven't come it across it. it. You certainly learn when they ask you to, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So where do we fit in here? I think our contributions are threefold. The first is we're going to study a large contraction in clinic access. Um, I mentioned much of the previous work, both on the abortion and the family planning side, study kind of early legalization of these um, uh, 
of these services, and um, and it's not necessarily the case we should expect the result, the the effects to be symmetric. The second is we're going to use modern or more recent data. Again, a lot of those papers use <coughs> data from the 50s and the 70s, uh, and and I think the la or we know the landscape for women has changed considerably over that time in terms of education attainment and labor force participation. So again, it's not necessarily clear that estimates from those earlier from data coming from those earlier times extends to to today. The last thing, and the, this, Ryan sort of touched on this, and that is that. We're going to separately identify the causal impact of both of these types of clinics. And the reason we're going to be able to do that, and we've, we think that's important, they provide different services. Previously in the literature, they've sort of been just kind of lumped into one. Uh, not necessarily, but one will be, we'll, we'll, they'll focus on one and then not the other. And I think that um, we think that, that we should consider them together and we have this nice policy setting where the change in access to one occurs and then the change in access to the other occurs and the one type of clinic doesn't provide the same type of service as the other. So, so let me just spend a couple minutes on, I won't get too far into the weeds here, but the first piece of legislation that we're going to be leveraging is this change in a, a large cut to the DSHS um, funding of clinics uh, and this DSHS is just the department, the State Department of Health in Texas. And this was passed in 2011, but it didn't roll out to the 2012 um, budget cycle. And it basically reduced funding by about, six, by about two thirds. And what happened, what, 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 how this rolled out was um, the, the, of the remaining funds of the smaller budget, the, the government, the DSHS decided to create a tier system where tier one and two clinics were likely to be funded. Um, tier three clinics were most likely not to be funded, and then, well, they, when they ran out, they just they had an order, and the order um, prioritized clinics that their main goal was to provide, provide preventative care, uh, and the lowest tier clinics were those that provide family planning services, so like subsidized contraceptives. Uh, as a result of this, about 25 percent of that actually ended up being mostly Planned Parenthood affiliates and others. So you can think about county um, clinics, and some of those are more geared towards family planning and some are more geared towards um, primary care and those county um, family planning ones would also be tier three. Uh, we actually do observe the, the funding tier, although we haven't used that yet in our analysis. Um, but what I can say is 25% of the clinics closed as a result of this policy and of the ones that remained open, a lot of them reduced um, their services on other margins. So you can think of there's like an intensive and extensive effect here of access. So uh, the ones that stayed open, many of them uh, reduce the hours of operation, reduce the number of practitioners, many of them substituted away from providing more expensive contraceptives like LARCs, which include IUDs, and more towards uh, lower cost contraceptives such as the pill. Okay? Yeah? Is, are, all this stuff, are all the legislation you're looking at something that can be predicted by the population, or are they sort of, are you like sudden changes? Yeah, so we all show you, um, we can do a little bit to look into that. Our, our debt, we're, our identifying assumption assumes that they're sort of unintended, or sorry, not unintended, they're unanticipated random shocks to the supply of clinics and they're not closures or reductions, reductions in service based on uh, demand, like shocks, to, or not shocks, but demand. Um, so they're not responding. The reason they are reducing their access is not because of demand. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, this unanticipated shock. Um, I'll show you what we can. To, that's, a, that's a fundamentally untestable assumption. It's the parallel trends assumption. Um, we'll, I'll show you what we can to try to convince you that that's, that there's, that that's the case. Yeah, good question. Um, so, uh, so that's the, first, that's the first piece of legislation. These first two both affect uh, family planning. The, sec the third one is going to affect abortion claims. So the second one is, was um, implemented in uh, 2013, the beginning of 2013. Um, and this is a little harder to explain, but essentially the Texas government um, was receiving a, a large share of their women's health program budget from the federal government through a Medicaid um, waiver program. And when they passed a piece of legislation into the, in this time period um, to exclude uh, a subset of family planning providers, the federal government deemed that unconstitutional uh, and decided to withdraw their contribution, which ended up being 90% of the budget, which is, amounts to about $30 million a year. They decided, Texas, to forego that money and they re replaced their, women, their previous women's health program that included all qualified providers to um, only include 
uh, providers that weren't affiliated with abortion. So providers, so remember, a family planning provider can't provide abortions, but they could be in the same network, right? They could be affiliated through that. So this, this program cut funding um, to, those pro, to those types of clinics, and they renamed this program the Texas Women's Health Program, um, and essentially was identical other than uh, not including that group of clinics. And again, that group of clinics, their, their goal, um, all of the, cl the goal of the, the, those clinics was to you know, provide family planning services to low-income women. It was, a, it was a safety net, okay? So that again, reduced access. The third piece of legislation rolled out at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, and this was House Bill 2, which many of you may have read or seen on the news, um, and this was essentially a, a bill that was aimed at directly reducing access to abortions or closing clinics. Um, it, it includes four um, different components. I'll focus on the fourth one. The first three were rolled out <laughs> earlier, so in 2013, the fourth came in 2014 and the fourth one was what caused a lot of, was the one that was sort of binding. It required all clinics to be an ambulatory surgical center, which was costly if you weren't, if a clinic wasn't one, it was costly to convert to that because there were there's a lengthy licensing process. There's also, you know, building renovations because to qualify you have to have certain width, uh, your, your hallways have to be a certain width, your, your um, exam rooms have to be a certain dimension, okay? As a result of all four of these components of House Bill 2, it caused over half of the clinics, just slightly over half the clinics in the state to close. So that's what we're, that's what we're, those are the three pieces of policy we're gonna leverage. So this is not intended to be, you know, some causal, uh, not, so basically this is not our main analysis, but what we've done here is we've, you know, we've done a very simple state level um, comparison where we plot here fertility rates per 1,000 women of childbearing age for Texas, that's a solid line. And then we've just plotted synthetic Texas using um, you know, the, the, the Donald and Lang, oops, yeah, the Donald and Lang, following Donald and Lang 2007, okay? So that procedure. And what you can see, what you can begin to see is that um, here we've also labeled the three cuts that we just talked about, what I just described. And you can see that we began to see some divergence in the fertility trend across synthetic Texas, between synthetic Texas and Texas, okay? So this is just suggestive that maybe these policies did, did impact um, fertility behavior, but of course, we wanna zero in and look at this more rigorously with micro-level data and really try to disentangle the effect of these two from that third one. So the data are, the data we, c we compile, like, you know, many sources to get our final analysis sample. I think the biggest undertaking was getting the clinic access because um, it's not that easy, it's just not that easy to go back in time and figure out when clinic, you know, the exact week a clinic closes. But what we could, what we were able to get was from the, t the Texas Department of Health, we were able to get license data so we could see when the clinic became licensed and when, and when their license would expire. Um, the problem with that is if you, if, if there's, you know, this, this, this policy that's, that's, lever that's uh, implemented and your license goes through 2017, but you don't comply with the ambulatory surgical center component, you, can't, you can no longer provide abortion, so we don't observe that in a license data. So that's problematic, right, for, I mean, getting, these, getting the treatment right is important here. So what we did was we went and worked with, I found this nonprofit, Fund Texas Choice. Their aim or their mission is to provide transportation and make appointments for um, under, uh, or underrepresented minorities who are looking to obtain these services. And so basically they call every clinic every week that they deem open and they like track, you know, where they open that week and then they like have that data. So I was able, after a lot of coaxing, to get that data out of a uh, very nice woman who works at Fun Texas Choice. Um, I then called, this was sort of tedious, but I then called all those clinics that we, that they said were still open. I cross, well, I cross-checked it first with DSHS. Most, most of the time it matched up, but some of these dates were obviously more, were sooner than the license exp expiration date. Um, and then I called all the remaining clinics just to make sure they were still open. And I sort of, at first I was like, hi, I'm a researcher. Uh, <laughs> and they're <were> like, Tum. <laughs> so then I had a different approach. Um, and I said, you know, I'm looking to get some information and how long, how long have you been in practice and so forth. Have there been any gaps in your, in your um, providing these services? So we think we have this pretty, after a lot of effort, we think that's pretty good. Um, we also get that information about access in border states to, from this same nonprofit 
that actually wasn't as hard to get because it hadn't changed, but, um, but that was, that, we got that from them. Uh, I also called them just to double check because I'm a little OCD. And then, um, we, and then we got a list of uh, locations and op uh, dates of operations from the Guttmacher Institute for Family Planning Clinics. This isn't perfect because they don't track it every year. So we're making the assumption here that the access hasn't changed um, since the most recent year of collection. Um, abortion rates, those come from each state department's health, or each department of health, the department of health of each state. Um, we got it for Texas and then we have it for the six nearby states, so the border states plus Colorado because um, there is uh, uh, evidence that people from Texas travel to Colorado. And, and then we just use the nat natality data that come from the National Vital Statistics System, um, which is great because it tracks, as, as many of you know, it tracks like every birth, um, nearly every birth, and it, it, the mother's characteristics and where, which county, you know, the location of the birth or the residence, um, regardless of if they're having the child in another state or Texas. Yeah. So the, sorry, the abortion rates data that you have, that's... They actually counts, but yeah, we convert them to... Okay, yeah. so they're, they're counts. Um, those are reported by the abortion clinic providers to the state, or is that... Yeah, okay. so... So it's administrative data. So where you're going is, I think, is, is right on, in that this is not the most reliable data. I mean, it's, it's a bit spotty. So I actually, we were trying at one point to use Florida as... Uh, as, an, as a, an alternative specification, uh, using them as sort of the counterfactual because things haven't changed in Florida. And they, for example, only port, report that for half the counties. They, you, so anyway, it's, it, this, I, I think this data is not the best. Um, it's actually well tracked in Texas, oddly. Um, I know, but, 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 but the thing is, is, I think that's where the importance of looking at the births come into play because that is really well tracked, well, that is a good data source, right? It's what good in the sense that we, we know it's the near universe of Earth and we know where their well, residents are. Yeah. And you're also, you're trying to control for leakage or measure leakage, right? But you are seeing like the largest border in Texas too. Oh, Mexico. Mexico. Yes, yeah, so like, I, exactly. So we think that it's not sufficient just to look at abortions. I think, I mean, I, we say that a lot in the paper, and I, I, I like stand by that. I don't think we learned that much from just looking. I kind of for the same reason, I don't think we learned that much from just looking at a single provider, uh, which I don't want to slam. I mean, they're all doing good work, but like the, I, I felt like those are sort of shortcomings in the other papers. Yeah, yeah. The abortion data are not available by race and age. They are. We don't report those here, but we have looked at that. We don't find anything compelling, like any compelling story when we do the when we look at the heterogeneity of abortions. Um, but we have, I think at one point they were in the appendix of the table and then someone told us to take them out so they're no longer there, but we've looked at that, yeah. Also, um, Texas changed recently. They issued a, um, in res another kind of odd thing um, in response to a, re a forthcoming JHG paper that shows that, I mean, our paper is, I don't think, very controversial, actually, the findings, but this paper was. It showed, I don't know if you're aware of Elisa Packham's paper, but that shows um, changes that they just look at the early, the 2012 family planning cut, and they, she shows that teen abortion rates, teen abortions go up, and Texas didn't like that, so they told her and us that the abortion data by age groups were wrong, they reported them wrong, um, and so they've <laughs> not changed the total number of abortions, but they've changed the way they group them, so they've changed the teen group, and it's much smaller now. And her results, I don't know if these are related, but her results were all uh, um, centered on teens. And um, it's been, we're, as a research team, we're trying, we don't want to get involved in that, honestly. Um, I know Jason Lindo has gotten involved because he was her advisor before she went on the market, and now she's an assistant professor somewhere. But anyway, yeah. It's a con yeah, so we're just, we're actually not, we're not sure how reliable the by age are because of that, because now there's two different sets of them. But we do think, but we do know they claim that, that what the Texas government is reporting as far as total abortion per year seems to be reliable across there. Yeah, so we're going with that. We also have um, contraceptive purchasing, like as I mentioned, that's the store month year level. That's just, for, that's from the Niel Nielsen Retail Scanner database. It's kind of an interesting data set if you haven't looked at it. I, I don't know, it's kind of expensive. Maybe you can convince Joe here to buy it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. Uh, may, maybe you can convince that when you go on to your PhD, you'll convince someone somewhere to buy it for you. It's, it's really interesting. It's, it's really detailed data on, uh, on uh, everything, essentially retail scanner data. And it's, uh, this particular one's put together by a group at the Booth School in Chicago. And then we have some county level, like time varying county level 
population controls. OK, so what do we do here uh, uh, empirically? We're just going to exploit this random variation access. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, oh, good, that works. OK. Um, so here is just a figure. And we're trying to represent the variation that we're using. So this is just Texas in each year. Um, and it's, it's picking up, it's showing the change relative to 2009. So um, let me tell you our measure. It's just distance from each population weighted county centroid to the address of the nearest abortion clinic providing abortions at that point in time. Okay? So, um, you know, there's no change here. You can see the changes coincide with the policies. The darker regions are areas that were more affected. So, you know, there's no, the change in access is like over 100 in the darkest and it's um, various subcategories. So the lighter um, regions experience less change or no change if it's white. Um, so, this, so this highlights the, the change in access. The, we can do the same exercise for family planning and you can see that, um, it comes a bit earlier, and we're trying to, so the, there's, you're thinking about, yeah, so here this comes a bit earlier, which coincides with um, the earlier family planning policies. Um, darker orange reflects a greater change relative to 2009. So what I want to point out here is our measure's a little bit different. The measure before was um, distance from each population weighted county centroid to the address of the nearest clinic providing abortions at that point in time. This is not, which means they were open. So they're either open or they were, were not, they were closed. Here we're picking up um, those clinics that are receiving um, funding, public funding at that point in time. Why? Because we don't have, we can't observe if they're actually closed. All we observe is they no, no longer receive funding. Um, we think this measure, we've, we've sort of agonized over whether this is the right way to go. Um, no one in the literature seems to have a very good alternative. Um, but we think this picks up both the intensive and extensive margin. So closures, but also changes on the intensive margin of like uh, reduced hours. Yeah. Um, sorry, back to the, the access to abortion clinics. Mm -hmm. There's that kind of dark blue concentrated area into 2014. It's on the border. Um, oh, right down here. Or, oh, no, no, sorry, oh. sorry, on the border of Texas, not the, the, not the Gulf. Yeah, up there. Oh. So that whole big area, is that, um, can you say the, Pop, the, the change in the distance, is that change in the distance to Texas abortion center, or is that, are you accounting for the distance to um, abortion centers that are just outside? All of them. Or we, or yeah, we include all of them, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it just so happens that, yeah, that's important, yeah. But they haven't, remember those haven't changed really, that distance. Right. But it might, but, but it might affect cl a closure in your nearby might change. That might now be the closest one. Right. right. That's what, that's we picked that up here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, I think my, my thought is sort of related about whether clinics are, are opening sort of near the, uh, oh. or if there's untapped demand. Um, we don't see that, but we also include every a border state clinic, all the clinics in the border states. Yeah. You don't, you don't see any evidence of that? No. No. Mm -mm. To open as these are having to close. No. Okay. And we have like those detailed call logs, so we think we would see it there. Um, the call logs are not Texas specific? No. Okay. They send people to call, as far as Colorado, yeah. But a lot to actually to Louisiana and New Mexico, to Albuquerque. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you might wonder like what the populations are like in that. We'll talk about that in a second, right? If, if it's not affecting, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So the getting to the identifying assumptions, someone asked that earlier. For us to be picking up for our estimate, our point estimates to be um, getting at a cause to represent a causal impact of at closure um, to clinics or change in access on our out, the various outcomes we're looking at or studying here, it needs to be that the variation in clinic access is you know in both types of clinics is uncorrelated with other unobserved time um, varying determinants of our outcomes, right? So. Again, this is sort of always the case. It's like fundamentally untestable, but we do provide in the paper uh, a discussion of several reasons why we, you know, think this is plausible. Um, but we also, and, and I guess to put this in an applied micro terms, sort of the parallel trends assumption, right? In absence of the policy, um, uh, the outcomes would continue on a similar trajectory, you know, in all counties at the same. Okay, so what can we do to kind of indirectly test this to, to reassure ourselves that something else isn't driving this. And what we do is we take um, 
we essentially regret, we try to like, predict um, access, so the change in access between um, the first policy and the end of our period with changes in access in the pre, or sorry, changes in fertility in the pre period, right? Because what we don't want to happen, we don't want to be the case that fertility, changes in fertility in the pre period are predicting changes in access. So we run this regression. It's, um, it's similar to a regression that's, uh, it's a Leahy, I can't remember, sorry, I'm blanking on the, the, um, the, uh, the citation, but we follow uh, another paper that's similar. Um, and what we find is there doesn't seem to be, so each estimate here, each point estimate represent, comes from a separate regression. In panel A, we're doing this exercise trying to predict abortion access, and in panel B, we're doing it for family planning access. And in the first column, we're looking at a linear um, measure of distance, and in the subsequent columns, we're looking at our um, binary measures of, in, in, uh, of access, which I'll talk about in a minute, which include no clinic within 25 miles, no clinic within 50, no clinic within 100. Um, and what you see is there doesn't really seem, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that, um, that pre-fertility rates are predicting access in the post period, okay? So that's, uh, and then, and then in, in the paper we go into some other discussion of why we think that's, that's the case. Have you looked at the content of the, the sort of policy shops to, to ensure that there's not other associated legislation like tied to it? Yeah, so, we, so there, one concern would be the Affordable Care Act expansion in 2014. Um, but luckily for us, Texas opted out of that, um, the family planning expansion and the expansion altogether. So we don't think that's affecting uh, things here. Um, there were some changes to the legalization in, um, or there were some changes way before our uh, start data or our, uh, our sample of, uh, I think, parental involvement laws. But um, maybe you know more about that. But we don't. We haven't. We have looked, and we don't. We don't seem to find anything that coincides. I mean, the biggest concern would be the Affordable Care Act, and our best defense to that is they opted out. But I mean, it's. I mean, it's always possible that something that that could be affecting it. Um, let's see. I will say that we do. This is where our analysis is robust, is starting at various different years. So we think that's also reassuring. But so our econometric specification is pretty simple. So our outcome here in our first part of the analysis is abortions uh, in a county year. Um, we. We control for a measure of abortion at clinic access. We also always control for a measure of family planning clinic access, and then a, a, a vector of um, county level um, characteristics that are changing over time. We include a county fixed effect and a year fixed effect. And we estimate these are, these are count data, so um, we estimate that counties are pretty small in Texas. There's 254 counties in Texas, so um, we think we, we sort of follow the literature, but we also looked at the distribution of the data. and. Um, think that the fixed effect Poisson is the best uh, way of estimating this. We've also done it uh, using OLS, um, where we use inverse hyperbolic sign transformation of, of, of the, the rate, and we get kind of similar results. So, um, we because um, counties have a different potential for births, just by uh, because different types of people live in different counties, we include women of childbearing age as the exposure variable when we estimate our fixed effect Poisson. We cluster the standard errors at the county level. We, we do this again for a births as counts, um, or we estimate the similar count model, but we use births as the outcome. And now births are at the county um, month year level. And so um, it's really the only change there. We also then finally in our contraceptive analysis, we look at contraceptive expenditures. Here we do estimate it via uh, OLS. Um, where we take the inverse hyperbolic sign of the expenditures, which is kind of like the log transformation, but it deals with, allows for zeros. Um, and you might wonder why we're not doing this at the county level, why we're going to the store level. The Nielsen data is not nationally representative. It's also not random which stores are in, in, in it. So we think a store fixed effect's pretty, pretty important here. Some of the stores are, are Vons or Albertsons, you know, Safeway. Some of them are convenience stores. Some of them are CVS. So um, we think, that the, that the store fixed effect's important. So it's like deviations from the average expenditures in the store. Is, is there, 
something, this has nothing to do with your identification strategy, it's more heter heterogeneity in the, or, or, or thinking about what the local average treatment effect is, right? What's the marginal clinic that, what are the characteristics sort of of the marginal clinic that are affected by this intervention? Yeah, I don't, uh, so characteristics meaning the type of people they serve? The type of people they serve and the types of services that they provide. And, well, the, abor the abortion clinics is just going to be Yeah, gonna be so this is more relevant. For me. Yeah, I mean, it's more relevant for the family planning. I mean, we don't observe, so what we can observe is their tier. Like, we know if they were priority in that funding cut, we know if they're a tier one, tier two, tier three, so we might be able to do something there to get at where, we, we actually should look at the share of tier two clinics. So I'm imagining all, at some point I looked at this, but I'm imagining, you know, tier one clinics were fine, they, they received funding and post the piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. Tier two, maybe some of, maybe there was a, a place where there was a cut. We should look at that, yeah. What, what do you think, so you're thinking that, um, No, I, 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 no, I'm, ju I'm just thinking of who, who, who is going to be sort of the heart, what, what, whether, the, the, the characteristics of those clinics that are likely to be hardest hit. What, yeah. what do they, you know, what do they look like? Well, yeah, so. Uh, I mean, so I, if I think about sort of your estimates in the context of what is it, this may be different than the average clinic closing, right? In, in the, or, or reducing access to the. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm, ju I'm just trying to think about th this particular policy and the, and the type of clinic it's likely to show. Yeah, so all of the, all of the, um, the clinics so I'm thinking about family planning now, not abortion, but all of the, the family planning clinics that, so the aim there was to, all those two policies were aimed at reducing or shutting down Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood types of clinics. So they were the ones that were disproportionately uh, affected. Mm -hmm. um, I do actually, I think the Lowe and Slusky paper is useful for thinking about that because they, I mean, they don't observe everyone else. It's sort of the problem, all the other clinics, but they do observe in fine detail. But we also have family planning. We are. We also have the Planned Parenthood clinics in our data too. So we could look. We could actually have a better number. We've kind of eyeballed it and been like, oh yeah, that that was consistent. Most of these drop off in the previous year or the the subsequent year. But we could get a better uh, quantify <laughs> that a little bit better. Yeah. Joe, are you thinking like demographics of who the clinic is serving, or like? Yeah, I'm thinking both about characteristics of the clinic and what 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 is sort of the quality of services that are being provided by the clinic, as well as who's being served by. Them. Sure. Just to get an idea. Because I think that who's being served is interesting and relevant to your findings with the like where the effects are concentrated. Well, so we know that the clinics that were on the chopping block, their mission was to serve was to provide contraceptive care to to low-income women and teens. That's sort of like, that's broadly, but that's not very, that's not like a, we haven't, we could, quant maybe we could quantify that better, yeah. I mean. Your map got me sort of thinking about, yeah, the, yeah I guess sort of more, more of the population being served. I guess. But, and it makes any potential controversial findings a little bit more like irrefutable, you know, if you're like, hey, our, like, well, effects with teens. And well, what, sure enough, the clinics that were affected were serving teens. Yeah, and, and also low-income women, which we don't observe, but we observe low education, which we take as a proxy, and we do find the results are concentrated, actually, for both types of clinics among that group. Yeah, Ryan? Well, this is one way to maybe get that. Are there systematic differences between Tier 2 and Tier 3 clinics? Like, uh, is it... Are they different types of clinics that land them, or is it kind of just whoever gets in first gets a higher ranking? No, no, it's it's tier one clinics are those with an emphasis on providing uh, primary care. Okay. So like a county, a, there are like county clinics that exist that are not necessarily for reproductive, like women's reproductive care. There are county clinics that just like men and women go to alike, right? And get, you know, because they don't have insurance, right? And those are publicly funded. Those were given the highest priority. So that's tier one. That's tier one. Now, where tier in tier two does it, or where does it drop off in tier three? That's, yeah. I think, what Joe's asking, yeah. and I'm not exactly sure, so we could look at that. it's like, given the tranche system, it's, you know, the, the tier threes are just so much less likely to be funded that if, if there were some kind of uh, administrative requirements to be on tier two versus tier three. Yeah, we could look. That would be a really easy yeah. I mean, say, like, look, these are the ones that are going to be affected, right? Well, all, I mean, so we could dig a, we could, I, I have a contact down at DSHS, so we could ask, we could ask for some more of their funding algorithm, if you will, but uh, what they did, to, what is in the documentation they gave us is that tier ones are those that provide prevent, or sorry, primary care, whereas tier 
lower tiered, um, clinics that were assigned a lower tier were, are those that primarily provide family planning services. So that's, that's the this, verbiage they use. But it's interesting because it's like, I mean, you're using language that's pretty squishy and it sounds like perhaps the the categorization was also squishy. Well, after I've described my experience with the Texas government, it might be squishy. I mean, these are, this is, I think one thing we learned is it sounds really simple. It's like, you just, policy change, things, you know, policy is active, there's a change, and it's a simple dip and dip, and it's like very complicated is one, one thing we, what's one takeaway. I mean, that's, we're trying to get as clean of estimates as we can. That's yeah, well, our I aim, yeah. Yeah, what I'm getting at is like, you, you might have some additional identification possible with like some discontinuities, just if it's, if it is that squishy, that tier one versus yeah. tier two or tier two versus tier three yeah. could, could provide yeah, yeah. Like, a, like discontinuity uh, opportunity. To if we observe enough births. But yeah, 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 that's a good point, thanks. <coughs> so just to get at the clinic access, just to dig a little, give you a little more detail on that. Um, we, we code these up as in several different ways. So we, we always include just one. We're not, bin, these aren't bins. These are just, we include one at a time. We have done it, bins, we have included it as like a bin style regression where we're, you know, have these, these we allow for this like, oh, well you all know what I'm talking about. So we, these are not bins. We're including them individually. And the reason is, is because we're trying to get as much variation as we can. Um, we have done this the other way and it's just a bit noisier. Um, but what you can see here is that we have no clinic um, so the first, the first uh, way we code this is no clinic within 25 miles is abortion clinic. Um, that's about before the policy is about 31% of the population and then it goes up to 41% post policy um, at its maximum. Um, uh, and then here we, uh, we also look at no clinic within 50 miles, no clinic within 100 miles. And the average distance um, over the whole period is 25 miles for abortion and uh, about seven and a half for family planning. Um, we do the same thing for family planning. You can see, you can kind of see here now the, the share of the population that's affected and also the change, kind of the change that we're exploiting. Okay, so let's, how much time do I have actually? Okay, yeah, we have, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the, so uh, we can skip over the heterogeneity too, but we look at, so first we look at abortion access. So this is just um, looking at the effects of abortion access on abortion, remember these are, these are um, count models that we're estimating. Each of these estimates comes from a separate regression. And as we um, move to the right, the fourth column is our preferred specification as it includes both, uh, includes all of the controls, the economic controls, the demographic controls, and the access controls. And essentially how you can read this is when there's no clinic within 25 miles, it, it, it it's a, leads to an 18% um, uh, 18% decline in abortions um, relative to having a clinic, at least one clinic within 25 miles. Okay, and you can see that as we increase sort of the severity of the treatment, as you'd expect, the magnitudes grow. Okay. So that's from your Poisson regression. Yeah. Okay. So does it is it right to interpret those percentages? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we do. Um, so you might say, okay, well. <laughs> abortion clinics closed and now there's fewer within Texas abortions. But remember, this is only within Texas abortions. We're not picking up out of the country abortions or um, out of the state abortions, or at least not all of them. Um, so what we do next is uh, we want to look at, we, we just have a very descriptive uh, figure that shows that there is evidence that some of, these, uh, some of these women are traveling. So here is just the abortion rate per 1,000 women of childbearing age. It's Texas. And then here, are the abortion the percent of abortions um, to non-residents in these other states? So what the, what we would like is if we just observe every Texas woman, um, if she had an abortion, which which uh, which county she had the abortion in. But we only observe abortions in Texas if they occur in a county within Texas, right? So the best we can do is this like descriptive. Um, graph or figure here showing that it does look like, at least descriptively, that there's an uptick, there's a share of, there's an increase in the share of abortions to non-residents in the border states, okay? And these are sort of, you can see how some states are, yeah. Specifically, it's, I mean, specifically it's in those two states. Yeah. Is it, is it they, do they have more lenient laws or something that may be explaining why? There's definitely a lot of, so 
this coincides with also what we see working with the nonprofit, looking at the nonprofit data and talking to them. They send a lot of, for whatever reason, they send a lot of people to New Mexico. My guess is there's just more practitioners there serving. And then, I mean, my other thought is it's right next to that big blob where they lost. Yeah, it's not that far. Yeah, 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 yep. Um, but again, we're not, we're not, we can't look at, you know, out of the country, which is unfortunate. I would like to do that. So, okay, that's, that's great. We think that there's a reduction in abortion when abortion clinics close. We think some of them, at least some of these women are traveling to nearby states. But what do the birth results look like? So when, when there's a change in access to abortion clinics, what does it look, how does that affect birth? And um, here, this is just a repeat of the abortion. So this is panel B, this is the birth. Um, and you can see that there's, you know, there's a 1.8% increase in births um, as a result when there's no clinic within 25 miles relative to the, when there is. But um, I should say that, um, yeah, yep, I guess there's not a whole lot to say there. So how many births roughly is that? Uh, so you're wondering like what that mean is? or So that's all ages. So it's like the mean birth per 1,000 women of childbearing age is 68.6. Um, so next we look at heterogeneity. We don't have a whole lot of time, so I won't spend too much time on this, but we can look at, you know, teens, women in their 20s, 30s, and 40, you know, early 40s. Um, and you see that it's sort of driven by older women, which was not necessarily what we expected initially. Um, I'll go through these kind of fast and summarize the results of, of the heterogeneity analysis at the end. Um, we also see when we look by parity that it's mostly driven by women who already have a child. Um, and it seems to be driven by women with low relatively lower education and those who are, you know, who are married um, and Hispanic. Okay. What, what do we make of this? Uh, oh, do you have a question? Oh, what do we make of this? We, we observe, at least in this data, the, the largest impacts are among relative older women, Hispanic women. But um, interestingly, I think, uh, not that, I think that's to be expected, but married women who already have children. Um, and, you know, it's not that we think that, though, that these, this group of women are more affected by the policy. I don't think the cost is necessarily greater for them. If anything, you could argue that married women who have a child are maybe in more stable relationships and maybe have more financial um, uh, means. Than, than teen women, but um, we do think it's, it's potentially that this marginal cost, although is it Clark? Yeah. He might disagree, but we do think that this is potentially that the marginal cost of an additional <laughs> child, you know, there's a, there's a marginal cost associated with having a child. If you already have a child and are married, maybe the marginal cost is lower than if you're a teen or someone who doesn't have children, yeah. Do you think that the policy could affect marriage rates? Uh, I haven't looked at that, yeah. Might, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that would be kind of interesting. You think possibly you know, more less access to yeah. making more likely to have a shotgun wedding or Yeah, we could look at we could look at marriage rates. Yeah, we've I think I mentioned to someone we looked at um, mother uh, we've looked at mortality among mothers and we've looked at because uh, there's actually been a, a huge increase in mortality. Um, and this is like well beyond the scope of the paper, but even labor market outcomes might be kind of interesting. Yeah, I don't know if we get the data up here is like <laughs> You know, yeah. the, the sort of the marginally impacted mother seems like a potential candidate that that's like they're on the margin of the labor market too. Like yeah. They could go back to work, yeah. they could stay at home. Yeah. And so like this this policy could, could have like potentially large impacts in the, the labor market for this. Yeah, well also I that no, I, I think that's a great point. I also have a thought at times <coughs> that we should look at take up of of other types of safety nets like I mean, who know? You know, like wh that was my first thought, right? Like maybe they're just substituting from one safety net to another. Maybe they're I don't know. But um, Joe, did you have a? Yeah, no. I'm just curious about whether there have been any. I mean, I know that abor abortion data by marital status is very crude. Right? Yeah. That's provided by the, the CDC stuff. I don't know whether Guttmacher provides any in, anything. We didn't get it from Guttmacher. Yeah, we got it from the the state's department's health. Yeah. Got it. Gotcha. And do, do you have any marital cuts by, on abortion by? Oh, uh, sorry. I'm, yeah. You know, oh, no, 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 no. So sorry, sorry. Yeah. I haven't heard about too many. Uh, I mean, sort of the the. 
I mean, if it's through an abortion-related channel that this is happening, presumably given this, given the abortion access yeah. policy, I'm just curious. I don't think I've ever heard too many papers that have ever found evidence that these policy shocks are are, are affecting are affecting abortion decisions among among marriage. But. Yeah, but I do actually. I I shouldn't even open my mouth about this right now. But I do know that the, I was surprised when I found out about the rate of abortions among married women. I thought it was higher than, I don't remember the numbers, but it, well, I do remember learning that it was higher than I had expected. And so presumably that, because the person who told me was an economist, presumably that there, that data is available. So we yeah. should look into that. Yeah, uh, I, mean, they're, 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 I know the CDC provide, you can't cut it in multiple ways. In, in, I think you can basically, like you can't cut it by age and race. And yeah, because they're but I think for on, anonymity, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I think you can get at least by marriage. Yeah. I, mean, I think that, I, that, I, I can't decide whether I'm skeptical or intrigued. Yeah, I so I will, I will say that we... Um, I, I, I believe it. Well, I find it yeah. No, so far the referees haven't either, so that's <laughs> nice. Were you our referee? Um, so one thing I will say is the birth... Um, I'll get to this in a second, but looking at births is a little bit... We don't have a very long post period, right? If you think about how you assign access um, and you think about... You could, we'll talk about it in a minute, but you could assign access at, uh, at the time of contraceptive. That's, that's assuming that the policy affects births immediately. But you might think about a 12-month lag, a 24-month lag, a 36-month lag. Now we don't really have any, we have very little post period. So we just, just like four months of 2015 because of that. And it happened, you know, these, so, so we don't, so essentially I found out yesterday we can get the latest natality data this week. So we're working on that before we... Do more, yeah. So I think that some of these might tighten up, but I, I, I happen to agree that I, I actually have somehow convinced myself that I don't think it's that strange. But you know, we could we could try to do some more on that. Yep. Okay. So the family planning access, we don't look at um, the effects of family planning on abortion. We do in the paper. We don't really find anything. Remember, they don't provide abortion, so there's the only way we'd only have to be through an indirect channel that that's impacting abortion. Um, but we do see. And it's not, we don't really see an effect, a contemporaneous effect. This is assignment of access at, contracept at contraception. So it's, um, so it's that, you know, it's contemporaneous. Um, we don't really, you know, it's very sensitive to controls. We don't really see an effect here. Um, but um, if you think about assigning it, there's lots of reasons to believe. Uh, maybe that's sort of arbitrary, assigning it immediately, right? Maybe, you know, uh, women have often stocks of contraceptives. They also, if they have long-acting reversible contraceptives, they last from three to 10 years, depending on the brand and the type. So, you know, there's no a priori expectation about the dynamic relationship between uh, uh, access to family planning and, and births, right? So, so what we do is we just um, include, uh, this is what was in the last, so this is panel A's no controls. Each column within a panel is our estimates from a single regression. Panel B includes all controls. So this is just a repeat of the last page. It's a contemporaneous effect. You can add a lag, the contemporaneous and a lagged. You can add two years and then you know three. And you kind of sort of see um, a consistent effect of a year lag, you know. Um, that's actually in line with a, this recent JHE paper that looks at the earlier cuts. Um, she finds a a lagged effect and doesn't find a contemporary effect yet. Usually, I mean, you, the earliest you're going to see an effect would be nine months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so that's what we, that's, that's, well, that's how, yeah. So, I mean, you I mean, could also would imagine be the. Alarming if you saw it at a different yeah, you could also time. imagine that, um, that, that uh, initially people are more careful because they don't, you know, and then, and then it's not the case that every time you engage in a sec sexual, uh, so, so, uh, you know that, that this occur that's resulting in a birth. You know the probability increases over over a time period, right? Okay, so I don't think this is that odd, actually. Um, oh yes. Oh, so we look at heterogeneity. So we do this by age. Um, we do seem to find it concentrated among teens and and you know these women in their thirties. I'll talk about. I'll come back to that in a minute and summarize our heterogeneity uh, birth estimates or the birth estimates by these different cuts of the data. But you know, and we see again, it's among women with kids. Um, here's some evidence that like low among, it's uh, driven by women with low education or stronger, the effect's stronger among women with low education or who are married. Um, I don't, you know, these aren't different from each other. Um, so we find the largest impacts among teens and women in their 30s who are relatively lower education who have married and who have kids. Um, and you know, kind of to someone's point earlier, that is sort of, that is the target. Teens, you know, teens and low-income women 
which were using low education as proxy, that was the target of those clinics that were the access was sort of reduced for. Um, and you know that kind of that's teens in low education. These married women with children. Um, it turns out by a recent report by the CDC, very recent report, um, that group is um, three times more likely to use these long-acting reversible contraceptives. I actually think that's a really interesting finding, and I wish we could push that a little more because. Um, their IUDs are a thousand, on average, a thousand dollars per procedure. Um, they're also highly effective, and they also were one margin that clinics. We know anecdotally, clinics were shifting away from providing those. Those are the ones that stopped receiving funding and towards very, very low cost, um, pill, you know, oral contraceptives. Yeah. So, what do we know about how many married women with children on their second children are availing themselves of services at these time of funding? We probably should learn more about that. So you say, say that. So yeah, the, no, the, I'm, I'm just wondering how often in thinking about a treatment on the tree. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how many married. Yeah. As, as I try Who's to get taking over, this up? I try, yeah. I try to get over my skepticism. Yeah, yeah. This is all being concentrated on married people with, I know. with more kids. I want to know how often, how 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 frequently they're using the services okay. in these clinics, particularly yeah. these clinics that are affected. The take up. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Can you explain any type of variation in like LARC prices? You know, has, is there is there any variation over your sample in just like market prices of LARCs that you might be able to kind of? Uh, not that I know of. Do you think is there know, a reason to think there would be? We don't observe, so they're not over the counter contraceptives. So let me get to those results. Um, yeah, it's just because we're in the interest of time, but. Well, I can think about that. I don't. I don't know of any, but uh, we could we could dig a little there. Um, I can't think of a reason why there would be a change in the cost, but um, I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, it's like no, this is how. I mean, anything, right? Anytime you say a, a, a little tidbit, like it spurs other thoughts. I, I guess what, I, what what would be cool is if you can if you can get at some some information that's describing like bark prices or costs or whatever that you could maybe tease apart that. Because you've got like this very heterogeneous like effect on like the teen moms and then yeah. the like stable married yep. couples. And so if, the, if, if the presumed ex explanation is that the it's being driven by you know IUDs. And yeah. Stuff, that if you could somehow like even if it's like a relatively weak instrument for that, not like a weak weak instrument. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even if you're not like, it's not like a slam dunk. If you can somehow maybe like tease that apart, like, and be able to separately identify those, that would, uh -huh. that would be. Yeah, because because all we can. Uh, expiration. So something, something, yeah, 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 like yeah, a big yeah, change. Yeah. I know. I'm like, what would exog what would exogenously well, change I, 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 besides like, something convoluted that's not exogenous? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Think about that. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Last, because we're we're real short on time, but um, we we can look at um, contraceptive purchasing behavior. I'm gonna kind of skip over the the effect of abortion on this. We don't really find a whole. It's not really that stable to the inclusion of our controls, so we don't want to hang our hat on those, right? These are this is sort of like our kind of preferred measure. You know, clinic within 50 miles, and you know these once you include controls, they sort of become quite noisy. Um, although you might argue there's suggestive evidence. If you look at family planning, we've reported these with the lags because we now think that there's good reason to believe this is the right, or at least um, we find effects here. Um, so uh, you can see that, you know, there is, they are a little sensitive to the inclusion of controls, but you know, this one's still, it's a bit noisy, but it's still an 8% increase in um, male condom purchases as a result of, uh, of family planning clinic access, or uh, when there's no clinic within, to be precise, when there's no clinic within 25 miles, um, there's an 8% increase uh, in male condom purchases relative to if there was a clinic, at least one clinic. Um, we want to look and see if this, you know, is this sort of an anomaly or how does this compare to if we look at 17 other subgroups of health products at, you know, we run a similar, we do the 17 other times, right, for other groups that should not be affected by these changes in access, right? You know, this is, again, this is for the abortion. I said it was a little noisy in the table. Again, you know, it's a little noisy. You know, we see, I don't know, looks like it's trying to be. Um, we're getting another year of data here, too, so that'll maybe help. Um, but here for the family planning, you know, it does kind of, when you include all the controls, I mean, this is the no controls, and you include all the controls, it sort of look like, you know, there's nothing really happening here among these other groups, and this one 
seems to stand out a bit. So we think that this is a little bit, um, this is suggestive at least that there's some, some uh, Joe skeptical. <laughs> this, is this is suggestive at least that there's uh, some, that there's some changes um, uh, to pre precautionary behavior. Now, whether that translates into to, to, to actual use is, is, is another story. Yeah. You find effects on fragrances. Yeah. And I think yeah. that could be that precautionary behavior right there. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> Or is that random? Like this is, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. So, okay, these are. Oh, it's, oh, 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 oh. You, got, you also find effects on first aid. Um, first, where is it? First Yeah, yeah. The, that's why I said these are like these are pretty suggestive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, are, are these the? Is this the like back alley abortion effect that you're identifying right here? Uh, so I will say that we've looked. I googled um, at one point uh, at home abortion, and I coded up all of those. And uh, there's some uh, various drugs you can herbs you can order. Um, and I didn't find anything, and I was very disappointed. This was back when I was also trying to get the emergency room data. So you know, started out very grand, and then here we are. Um, okay, so this is a, it's robust to a lot of checks. Um, we include um, health region specific line, uh, linear trends. We start the sample in various years to think about how the Great Recession would affect things. We, uh, we include border counties, we exclude border counties, we look at, we look at all that. And I've, I've kind of already gone through the findings, but just sort of the takeaway, you know, there's, just to conclude, there's been, there's a large debate on whether we, sh on whether, you know, a, the government or the, the, the um, the, the country should uh, publicly fund uh, uh, health family planning clinics, and uh, it's controversial whether abortion clinics should exist. Um, and I think one thing that highlights that is the, the Medicaid, um, or the Affordable Care Act. Uh, one of the things, the Affordable Care Act, one of the pieces of that is it expands, does a lot of things that it expands. Uh, uh, there's a Medicaid expansion that expands funding to family planning um, clinics, and um, Part of the reason many uh, individuals are uh, uh, looking to overturn or to repeal the ACA is because um, they, you know, don't agree with funding that sort of funding of those clinics. So I think just sort of highlight this is a very, you know, politically sensitive topic. We are just looking at Texas, but I think this discussion extends to the national level. So I think what we find here is not just necessarily a case study. I think it's larger than that. Um, because of the discussion that's occurring currently. And then finally, I would just say that I think we shed light here on the fact that it's important to separately look at these two types of clinics because a lot of states are moving to this funding model or this um, model where they, they provide, they do provide different um, types of services. Here in California, that's not the case. They, uh, you know, you can go to, you can Google Planned Parenthood and see their services they provide and they'll provide all the things that the two types of clinics provide, but there are a number of states, um, at least nine that, that have it separate or separately um, uh, that have two different types of clinics to provide these uh, services. So I'll conclude at that. Um, thank you, uh, and I appreciate all your comments and any comments you have after. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Being here.